And it's a good thing. You want to know why? Because if you're watching online, there is a bunch of fellowship going on here at Wichita South. What do y'all say this morning? Happy Sabbath! Yes, what a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I just want to welcome everybody. I want to welcome you. I want to look in your eyes. I want to look at your eyes. And I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. And I want to ask those of you to look to your left and to your right. And if you see a face you don't really recognize so much, I just want you to wish them a happy Sabbath. In fact, why don't we just make it an occasion, Pastor Jeff? All right, hit it. All right, stand up and, and put a hand out and, a, and an arm and a, a shake a leg. I don't know. Wish somebody a happy Sabbath. Walk across the pews. Let's praise God this morning. And if you see a mom out there, grab a mom. If you see a mom out there, just grab her. Just grab her. Yeah, oh, I got my hug over here. Woo, happy Sabbath too. Yes, no one gives a hug like Brother Fox over here. Amen. Yes, yes. This is what the house of God should look like every Sabbath. In fact, when we get home, by and by, on the other side of eternity, where we're going to be sitting at the welcome table, it's going to be just like that. The chatter, the noise, the laughter, the hugs. This is exactly what we have to look forward to when we see Jesus again. Amen. So I hope you were able, in the midst of welcoming one another, I'm hoping you were able to grab a mom. Could I see the hands of the, the moms in the house of God this morning? Where are the mamas? Where are you at, mama? I see you. Yes, I see you. I want you to reach over to, I heard someone in the back, reach over to a mama and, and just give her a little half hug and say, happy Sabbath and, and happy Mother's Day. Grab a mama. Don't leave them alone. And then to all of my little people, all of the kids, those of you who will be coming for children's story, I want to direct your attention to the bulletin here. It's sermon notes. You're going to need your sermon notes because right here is a picture for you to co color for Happy Mother's Day. And, and I want to ask you to color these 11 tulips and, and turn it in. All right? Color this during the service. If you need some crayons, some pencils, come see me. Come see one of our deacons or deaconesses. We, I see someone has a box over there already full of something to use to color. So, before we begin, I want to give us a couple of announcements. Um, one of those are, today is potluck. We have a very special program today. And, and not only are you going to get fed today, but afterwards you're going to get fed again. And today we have with us Dr. Conrad Vine, whom we are very blessed to have this morning. He's the president of the Adventist Frontier Mission, a very sought after speaker, and he is here in the flesh this morning. And so what a blessing that is. Please make him feel very welcome this morning. He travels around the world and with a message of mission. And so once today's message is over, it's not over. It doesn't end there. I wanna invite you after today's service to meet us down the hall in the fellowship room over there. We're going to have lunch, we're going to have potluck, and then we're going to have another message. I'm just so happy that Doctor is here with us this morning, and I want to be able to show our appreciation, not only in, in hugs and high fives, but I want to take up a, a love offering after that service. So if, there, if you want to contribute, if you're inspired, 
If you, if you get that sense of mission as well, we want to ask that you donate as well for his cause and the ministry that he's a part of. Finally, a couple more things here is All-Star Night. I want to see how your free throw is. Brother in, over here, how's your free throw? You have a good free throw? How's your... Okay, I was just checking. He said back in the back, he said, okay, he's got a good free... We're going to need that because tonight, after sunset, come by to support the eighth grade class for their trip they're going to be taking. So you can come, and even if you don't have a very good free throw, come see us and, and play some basketball, fellowship with us, and, and support the eighth grade class through snacks and things of that nature. I also want to recognize our graduates at 10.30 a.m. May 14th in the Fellowship Hall. Bring a card to celebrate our graduates and wish them well as they take on a new chapter in their lives. If you have any other graduates to be celebrated that are not on this list, please let us know. I'm going to read a couple here, but if you've been missed, I need you to, to wave at me here. I've got, as so far for high school, I've got Jaira, Jair, wait, Jaira Marcenaro. I've got Jared Jaid and Jared Marcenaro. I've got Samantha. I've got Isaiah. In the eighth grade, I've got Atticus and I've got Ava. Are there any names of graduates that I may have missed? I'm looking out into the crowd here. Did I miss any graduates graduating from anything? Geneva. 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 Geneva in the house of God, yes, we need to see you after College. Geneva. We need to get you. We need to appreciate you as well. If there are any other graduates, we want to recognize you. This is a, a milestone, a, a great accomplishment, achievement, and we just want to celebrate here at, with our church family. Well, I, I think I covered everything. You can find more news in our bulletin. If you're not a part of our, our mailing uh, email circuit, come see us afterwards. Uh, another part of it I don't want to forget is we want to ask uh, that uh, if you have any tithes and offering, we thank you for the ways that you give. We want to ask that you, you can give online. It's very easy to do. You can leave it at the back after service, or you can leave it with the Manascos if you have a check or something you need to leave. And I think I, I, think I covered everything. Was that everything? You got it. Okay. Well, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, and happy Mother's Day. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to stand with us as we sing our opening hymn, Marching to Zion. The words will be on the screen, but if you'd like to open your hymnal, it's number 422. Please sing out. I got some bad stuff in my, my throat this, this day, so it's definitely not a solo day. So join us as we sing Marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne. And thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. The beautiful city of God, the hill of Zion, leads a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields. Before we reach the heavenly fields, or walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're 
marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. To fairer worlds on high. To fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of Let's God. Let's sing that once more. We're marching. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Amen. You may be seated. There is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Those who are willing and able and would like to, please join me as we kneel for prayer.
Lord, we give you thanks this morning for a beautiful Sabbath. The weather is so fresh and so bright and ready for the spring and the coming summer months ahead of us. We rejoice because we know that you are God of all things. You are creator God. And we look for ways to honor your creation this Sabbath day. Places where we can see your creative hand at work in the flowers and the trees and the new life all around us. We give you praise because we cannot do it. We cannot open a single leaf or a single flower and have it bloom. You are the one who created and designed nature to work according to your wisdom. And we pray this morning for your grace, for your mercy. When we have fallen short of your plan and your design, we ask for your forgiveness this morning together, collectively, corporately, as a church family. We acknowledge the ways in which your holiness and your wonder and your glory and goodness contrasts with the ways that we ourselves don't always do everything we want. We don't always do the good things like Paul says that we want to do, that we long to be able to have the strength to do, but that we lean fully on your grace and your power of your Holy Spirit working in us to renew our hearts, renew our minds. We come to you humbly this morning, acknowledging that here is a place, here is a church family where we are safe. No matter what life or the world brings towards us, we don't have to worry. We can join you and join with your spirit, that spirit of courage and trust and joy that you have planted deep inside our hearts that cannot be shaken no matter what comes that this is a place where we can come and trust in you and know that we have a, a merciful and gracious and kind Redeemer, name above all names that we lean upon and that we can trust that with you, there is nothing to fear. With you by our side leading us, we have a glorious future, a Zion to march toward because of who you are. We honor you this morning also on behalf of those in our family that aren't here this morning, that can't come because of physical ailments or maybe are just hesitant to come for whatever reason that might be. We just pray that your spirit can be very close and that you can give us wisdom and courage to make sure that we are your hands and feet in this world, that we are doing the things we talk about, that we are acting and serving on behalf of you, the good God that has put your spirit in us that we are so grateful for this morning and celebrate. And now this morning, Father, humbly we come before you, your children, and we have words you've given us to pray together. So we honor you this morning as we join our voices and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's now time for our children's story. Our children will come around and look at you until you hand them some money. And all of that money is going to go to Christian education right here at our church school at Waka. So get ready and have the kids come up.
Mr. Stan. Good morning. Come on up. Oh, look at all of that offering. Oh, that's wonderful. If you still have dollars, wave them. They'll come get them. What is tomorrow? Mother's Day. Oh, have you planned something special for your mom? Oh, if not, you, you have a, you know, I don't know, to, to see the sun go down about 8.30. At what time you go to bed? Okay. There you go. You better get up, either stay up or get up early in the morning. Get something figured out for mom. Okay. So what we're going to do is a little trivia about moms of the Bible. So in here I have some ki kids' names, names of children in the Bible. And you're going to tell me who their mother is. Okay? But. See, see Mr. Ty there? Mr. Ty has this, the, the right answers, and we're going to look at him, and he's going to say yes or no. But we also have some people here on the front row. See those coaches over there? Sir? Mr. Stan and Ms. Beardsley. If you need a lifeline, you can go over there and show them your card and see if they can help you out. And if they can't, we'll ask a neighbor. Okay? All right? So we can figure this out. So, I'm going to see. Reach in my, car, in my bag and pull out a card. Don't look. Don't look. No cheating. Okay. Who's on that card? Abel and Cain. Abel and Cain. Who was Abel and Cain's mom? Do you know? Who? Abel. Eve. Oh, give him a hand. Good Ooh. job. Very good. I can take that back. Okay. Can I reach in my bag? No? Do you want to reach in my bag? You want to get a card? Do you want to get a card? Oh, no. Okay. We'll help. Do you want to get a card? No. I have no takers. You'll take it. Okay. Good job. Will you take a card? Oh. Okay. Who's on the card? Isaac. Who was Isaac's mom? Do you not know? Go ask your friends. Go ask your friends. Is Rebecca the right answer for Isaac? No. No. We're so sorry. Okay, come up here. Okay, come up here. If you know the answer and you can help out my friends, raise your hand. <gasps> it was Sarah. Was it Sarah Ty? Oh, give her a hand. Good job. All right, let me take that one. All right. Yeah. <gasps> Will you help? Okay, it's all okay, Stewie. I'll be right there. Here. Can you take one? I know they're kind of stuck together. Oh, who's on your card? Oh. It says Ishmael. Do you know who Ishmael's mother was? Who? Your mom? <laughs> we won't go there. Okay. Friends, do you know who Ishmael's mom was? Did you know? Oh, no. Hagar. Is it Hagar? Is that right? Oh, good job. Oh, you want to try? Okay. Good job. Oh, did you get one? Oh, I know there's lots in there. Take that one. Okay, can you read it? 
Jacob and Esau? Who was Jacob and Esau's mom? Do you know? Rebecca? Rebecca. Is Rebecca right? God, give him a hand. Good job. Thank you. Oops. Let me, are you going to keep it? Okay. Can you take a card? See, it's really not so scary. We have lots of help. Who's on your card? Timothy. Timothy, New Testament. Do you know who Timothy's mom was? <gasps> Go ask your friends. Eunice? Eunice, was that correct? Oh, good job, friends. All right, we're going to go back here. Would you like to try one? Oh, thanks. Oh. Who are the children? Jesus. Who's Jesus' mom? Do you know Jesus' mom's name? That's right, good job. All right. Would you like to choose a card? No. Can I have Marty choose a card for you? And you can help. You and Marty can work together, okay? Who's that? Oh, man, this one's hard. Okay. Milan, Chilean, and this is, this is, this is a little extra. The daughter-in-law's name was Ruth. Do you know who that is? Do you know who that is? Ask your friends. Okay. Naomi. Naomi, is that correct? All right. Good job. Good job. You want to do another one? Okay. Okay. We'll make this one our last one. Okay. Who did you get? Moses. Moses, do you remember who Moses' mother is? Was? Still is? Go ask your friends. Jochebed is correct. Good job. Good job, everybody. And there's, I'll take those. There's tons of more, so it would be a fun day, afternoon just to go and figure out, we'll do it again sometime, figure out all the other moms and children in the Bible. Now, oh, thank you. We're going to have a prayer for all of our moms, and then we want you to be helper friends. Do you see those flowers over there? We're going to go over there, and everybody's going to get three flowers, and then you're going to take them and give them to all the ladies in our church. And don't forget to go up in the balcony, somebody, okay? And don't forget to go back into the mother's room. So you guys are going to help me hand those out here when we get finished, all right? But first, we're going to say a prayer for all of our moms. So can you bow your heads and close your eyes? And let's think of to Jesus when we're, we're praying. Dear Jesus, we want to thank you for the fun time that we had today learning and relearning about the moms in the Bible, but Lord, we just want to lift up all of our moms to you, wherever they are, our moms and our grandmas and our aunties, and all the ladies who have helped us to grow and to become the people that we are. We just thank you, Lord, for putting them in our families, and we just thank you for putting them in our church, and please, this Mother's Day weekend, we just ask a special blessing on them. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayers. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right, let's go get some flowers to hand out. Landon and Landon, would you guys kindly be helping get flowers?
Testing, testing. I'll just wait for our children to hand out the remaining flowers. to what the world calls birthing people, but we still call them mothers in the church. Mm. <coughs> Our scripture reading today is taken from Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. I apologize to the gentleman on the screen there. Uh, and, uh, I'm saying this church, we rise for the hearing of the word of God, so uh, if you can rise with me. We'll be reading from Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It's the story of uh, Hagar. We read there, it says this, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. May God bless us as we reflect on this story today. So please take your seats.
Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I woke up this morning without a voice, which is rather inconvenient for a preacher. It's like being Patrick Mahomes without a ball, yes? It's like a fundamental problem. So, um, thank you to whoever put these uh, cough medicines up here. I really appreciate that. I'll probably be uh, self-medicating as we go through the sermon here. I'll just put one up there for when I need it. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be with you here on this beautiful Sabbath day in warm and sunny Kansas. I, uh, I left yesterday from Berrien Springs where it was about freezing. And I arrived down here and I thought, oh, what a nice part of the world to live in, a place of endless sun. And uh, I soon discovered that you have very variable temperature down here in Kansas. But um, it's been a privilege to share last night and part of this morning with you all. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Pastor for your warm welcome and uh, uh, where I'm staying and uh, Brother Brent for uh, inviting me down here in the first place. Or Brent, uh, many, many months ago I think this was now. And uh, today <coughs> I'm going to be talking a sermon called The God Who Sees uh, based on the story of Hagar and... Um, What's happening here is that on the screen, the, the Hebrew is turning into kind of uh, dingbats or something. So that's not what it reads like in the Hebrew, but on my screen here it says Hebrew, but up there it's uh, the, the, the screen, the uh, computer's not reading the scripts. But anyway, I'm going to be talking today about uh, one of the names of God, uh, the God who sees. And we, fe- we meet that God in the story of Hagar at the well. I've been greetings from my wife. Um, I have one wife, um, which is good because um, more than one wife is more than one mother-in-law, and that's a, <coughs> that's a built-in self-correcting mechanism. Um, <coughs> Solomon had a thousand wives, which means he had a thousand mothers-in-law. Now, I struggle to remember one wedding anniversary a year, let alone a thousand wedding anniversaries. And if you have 2,000 women in your life like that, that means that six birthdays a day you have to remember and three wedding anniversaries. It's no wonder that poor, that poor Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes, which is futility of futility. Everything is futile, right? Nothing is ever right with a thousand mothers-in-law in your life. So, um, <coughs> it's a, I bring greetings from my wife. We have two children. My uh, son is at Southern, and our son, our daughter is at Andrews Academy. She's a junior. Um, I speak funny because I was raised in England, and I'm hoping I can, my voice can just last out this sermon here this morning. And so uh, I really appreciated the music this morning. Uh, thank you to uh, Sister Carlson for leading the singing for that. Uh, the music was beautiful. I normally make um, a joyful noise to the Lord, not necessarily a harmonious noise. Uh, today I was grateful to make any noise to the Lord. I was um, <coughs> just trying to preserve my voice so we can get through today. So uh, this afternoon, a lot, last night we spoke about the sexual revolution. We spoke for two hours on that. Um, that was been recorded upstairs there in the audiovisual desk. If you want a copy of that, you can pick it up from the audiovisual desk. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about small religious liberty issues. I'm going to be talking about some of the other revolutions that are taking place in front of our eyes. One is the revolution involving our money and uh, what digital currencies mean for religious liberty. I'll also be talking about the revolution in human biology and what is known as uh, transhumanism or humanity 2.0, which is happening in front of our very eyes. And I'll also be talking about the fourth industrial revolution and what that means for us because we are now starting the fourth industrial revolution. And each of these revolutions has a profound impact on our religious and civil liberties. So I'd invite you to come back today after potluck. We'll be talking about those three um, revolutions that are taking place in front of us and um, and understanding what they mean for us. And the bottom line is this. With every passing day, um, the coercion of conscience of Revelation 13 becomes more and more technologically feasible. That's the basic message, that the, the architecture for people being cut off from buying and selling globally at the touch of a button is almost in place. Technologically, we're almost there. And so um, we've just gone through um, a crisis of conscience with the COVID pandemic. We've all responded to it in different ways. And uh, there's going to come another crisis of conscience upon our world. And that crisis of conscience um, will be of a, a measure we've never seen before. And so it's important for us to think about these matters before that crisis comes. 
um, because your, con your character is not um, made in a crisis, your character is revealed in a crisis for what it already is. And so the decisions that you and I take today and through these coming months and years, um, they're actually molding our characters and preparing us for that final crisis when it breaks around the world. So we're going to start today, uh, our sermon though is going to be called The God Who Sees. This is not a religious liberty sermon, um, <coughs> it's just a uh, more general sermon. And I love the names of God because each name of God is a window into his character. So bow your heads with me and we'll invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of standing and uh, sharing your word with your people here in Wichita, Kansas. Father, thank you for bringing us to this house of praise and prayer on this Sabbath day. We thank you for the sun that is shining. We thank you for the transition from winter to spring. We thank you that your promise to Noah that there will be seed time and harvest and heat and cold and night and day as long as this world shall exist. We thank you, Father, that promise is playing out in front of our eyes today. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to this planet in rebellion. And today, Lord, we come into your house asking to hear your voice speaking to our hearts. Lord, we've probably imbibed many hours of, of social media this week, but I ask you that it be your voice that is heard today and the voice of no one else. I pray, Lord, for the protection of your angels upon this house of worship, and I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. <coughs> I gave this example last week when I was preaching in North Carolina, but um, uh, when you stand up to preach these days, you have to get to the point. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So, um, when I was a, a pastor, I did, I did a, a remote rural district in northern Minnesota, and I had three, let's say I had 300 members in my congregation. I'm just doing the math in front of me here. 300 members, each of whom is imbibing a minimum of four hours of social media or godless content on a daily basis. Do you think that's fair? By the time you drive to work and back, you're listening to talk radio or NPR, or whatever you listen to. You may have music playing in the background. You may watch a movie. Um, you know, there are things that we as Adventists, many Adventists do, so the average Adventist is spending at least four hours a day on social media. Or um, let's, put, let's call it this way. This is um, secular content that's shaping your worldview, whether you like it or not. So three times 400, 300 times 400, that's 1,200. There's 1,200 hours of secular content that's going into your members' minds on a daily basis. Now, assuming that your members watch nothing or listen to nothing on the Sabbaths, that gives them about 313 days of the year. So you times that 1,200 by 313, you get to about 375,000 hours a year are going into your members' minds and brains of secular influence that's shaping how your members think, whether they like it or not. And uh, bit by bit, the members start to reflect the secular culture in the world around us. So when you stand up to preach as a pastor, if you're in a three-church district and here you're blessed, you have like a kind of a one-and-a-half church district or... I'm not sure quite how it works here, but anyway, if you're in a three-church district like I was, you have 52 Sabbaths in the year, and you take away two Sabbaths for camp meeting, that gives you 50 Sabbaths, and you take away um, three Sabbaths for vacation, that gives you 47 Sabbaths, and you take away four Sabbaths for communions, actually, 16 Sabbaths for communions, that gets you down to 31 Sabbaths left. And you divide that by t three congregations, you're basically, if you're lucky, in each congregation 11 times a year. And if you're going to preach for 45 minutes, that means that you have about, let's say, eight and a half hours of sermon material. And if your members ask you to preach the same sermons in the different churches, you do a series, let's say the story of Abraham or the story of Paul or something like that. Um, basically, you have about eight or nine hours a year to counteract almost 400,000 hours of secular influence in your members' minds. So you just do the math, <coughs> and you realize that these days we cannot afford to stand in the pulpits and talk about warm fuzzies or sweet nothings. Time is too precious, Satan's attacks are too fierce, uh, time is too short, and you and I are too precious to God to talk about anything but getting to the point. So, as a preacher, you have a responsibility before God to make sure that when you stand in the pulpit, you have a message for that congregation from the Lord for this day, and it's a message that's not like a scattergun or a shotgun, it's a message like a sniper's rifle. It's going to hit home to the point. 
It's going to touch people's hearts and minds, and people are not going to go home and, oh, they're going to go to potluck, and we eat the food, and sometimes we dine on the flesh of the preacher as well. But people are going to go home, and they're going to have a change in their life. So we don't just come and have a spiritual feast and go home. We come and God changes us in the process. So the assumption behind this sermon, or all the sermons we hear in the pulpit, is that each one of us will get up from hearing the Word of God a different person to the person that came in this morning. So I'm challenging you today that if you hear the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, convicting you about something, don't harden your heart, don't quench the Spirit, listen to what the Spirit is saying to you and go home and put it into practice in your lives. Because time is too short and your soul is too precious and you don't know whether you're going to even make it home today in your car. So, we can't beat about the bush. We have to get straight to the point on certain matters. So, <clears throat> uh, this, this sermon I'm preaching today, I wrote it about four weeks ago. I wrote a series of sermons on the names of God. This is one of those sermons. I was going to do another one, uh, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner which is the story of Abraham and Moses sitting up on the hill uh, while Joshua is fighting the Amalekites in the valley and he has Aaron and Hur holding up his hands. And whenever the hands were lifted up and the hand was holding up the staff of God, the, the Israelites were winning the battle. And whenever the hands came down, the Israelites were losing the battle. And the point about that sermon is, and the point about that is that that word Jehovah Nissi or Yahweh Nissi, that word Nissi means a banner but it's also when Moses lifted up the serpent on the rod, that was also the banner. It's the same word. And then you go forward to John 12, that if I am lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And so the point about that sermon is that when Jesus is lifted high in a congregation or in a city, the gospel goes forward. And when God's followers do not lift Jesus high, then the gospel retreats. But we're going to look at another name for God, and it's this one here on the screen, the God who sees, El Roy. <coughs> And names have meanings. Would you agree with me? Yeah, names have meanings. So um, in England, we had a bunch of kings. I'll give you their names, and you can give an, and get an insight into what those kings were like. We had a king in the Saxon era, about 600 AD, called Ethelred the Unready. Would you like to have lived in his kingdom? No. We had a king who united the, the Saxons and kicked out the Danes, because the Danes conquered the eastern half of England from the 6th to the 8th centuries. He was known as Alfred the Great good time to live under Alfred the Great. We had a king who built Westminster Abbey, or at least built most of it in about 1000 AD, that's 2100 years ago. His name was Edward the Confessor. He spent all his time in the confessional, and so he invested the wealth of the Kingdom of England in building what we now call Westminster Abbey. He wasn't much of a king, but he was obviously confessed up. Edgar the Peaceable, not a good name for a king back in the day to be Edgar the Peaceable. We had a king who conquered us. He was the Duke of Normandy. His name was William, Duke of Normandy, but he became known in history as William the Conqueror. And he conquered England in 1066 AD. That's when modern English history begins in 1066. And uh, he, he did a survey of all of England. It's known as the Doomsday Book. That book is still in existence. Every town, every county, every shire who lived there, you can go and read it in the British Library. It's an amazing book, over a thousand years old, the Doomsday Book. Then you had a king called Richard the Lionheart, but uh, he was a Norman, and so he called himself Richard Coeur de Lyon, which is French for Lionheart. And he's, he was known as the Lionheart because he spent his time on the Crusades. Now, he didn't spend much time in England. He spent three months at the start of his reign, raised enough money, went off to the Crusades, conquered Jerusalem, and on the way home, he was captured by a French count. And I'm not sure if that's the origin of the antipathy between the English and the French, but anyway, he was captured by a French count who charged the English um, people two years national income, like twice the American GDP of today, in order to free their king. So the English raised the money, ransomed their king, and on the way home, he decided to get his money back, so he sacked a French castle on the way home and was hit in the neck by an arrow and didn't make it home. His name was Richard Coeur de Leon. His brother followed him, who had an interesting name, John Lackland. Would you like to live under the reign of a king whose name is John Lackland? Probably not. Lackland, and he was the guy that signed the Magna Carta in 1215. And he was known as Lackland because he mortgaged all the crown's lands to raise French mercenary armies to fight the English barons who were insisting on basic rights. And he lost those battles, so he became known in his history as John Lackland. So names reflect their character. 
And in the Bible, names also reflect characters, do they not? So Ab Abram becomes what in the book of Genesis? Okay, Abraham. And Sarai becomes? Okay, and uh, Simon becomes Peter. And Jacob becomes Israel. And Saul becomes Paul, okay, so when people's names change, it reflects their characters. And when we get to heaven, we see in the seven churches, that when we get to heaven, God will give us a new name that reflects our spiritual experience. That name will be written on a little white stone. And so God knows your character. He knows your spiritual experiences. He knows the highs and the lows. And he is going to give each one of us a name that uniquely captures and reflects who we are and the journey we made in life. That's a beautiful promise from God. And does this apply to us today? Well, absolutely it does. Uh, there's a psalmist, he wrote this, those who know your name in Psalm 9 and verse 10, those who know your name put their trust in you. So knowing God's name is important because God's names are windows into his character. And so if I show you um, around this church, we have these beautiful stained glass windows. I mean, they're really beautiful, yes? Now, if you look at these stained glass windows from the outside, what do they look like? pretty much nothing. It's kind of like gray nothingness. They look kind of dirty. But when you come into the church, those gray dirtiness um, smudges of glass, they now source a brilliant illumination. And it's like that with the names of God. When you're outside the kingdom of God, the names of God have no meaning for you. But when you come into the kingdom of God, the names of God, and there are many names of God, they are a source of illumination into a part of his character. And so when we know God by his names, each name is a promise for us. Sometimes it's a command, but it's generally a promise. And it's a revelation of an aspect of God's character that we need to hear from time to time. So when you pray or have your devotions, don't just say, Oh, dear Heavenly Father, or Abba Father. Start mining the scriptures for the names of God. Because there are times when you need to pray to Him as the Good Shepherd. There are times when you need to pray to Him as a consuming fire. There are times when you need to pray to him as the Lord our righteousness, Yahweh Tzidkanu from the book of Jeremiah. And so learning the names of God actually enriches your devotional life and builds your faith because you understand more about his character. So there are some names of God that most of us are familiar with. El Shaddai, you've heard that? It means God Almighty. Uh, Je Abraham gave that name to God in Genesis 17. Then you have Jehovah Jireh, yes? Uh, that's the story of Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac on, on Mount Moriah. And the Lord will provide. The word uh, Jireh um, was translated into English as provide, which is, 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 a, is a Latin phrase. It means that God sees into the future. And when God sees into the future, he knows what your needs are in the future. Therefore, you can trust him today. So the word to provide is providere in Latin. The, the, the God who we serve sees your future and he knows what you need to survive into the future. Jehovah Rapha, Exodus 15, is the Lord who heals. Beautiful name for God. When you're struggling with, with a terrible diagnosis, praying to Yahweh Rapha or Jehovah Rapha, however you pronounce it, the Lord who heals. The Lord my banner, Exodus 17. The Holy One of Israel, Leviticus 19, Kadosh Israel. God is a holy God, and he calls us, his people, to be likewise holy. And he tells us in the book of Exodus what it means to be holy, and what God means by holiness is a direct rebuke to what is happening in America today. We are called to be holy in all aspects of our lives, not just what we do with our bodies, but what we allow into our minds and to pass from our tongues. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23 is a name for God. It's not a description. It's a name for God. Yahweh Roy. The Lord our righteousness is another name, and we could go on and on, but we're going to look today at El Roy, the God who sees, which is the story of Hagar at the well. And so next slide, what we find in, if you look at any movie in America today, any movie from Hollywood has basically three components. You have a situation followed by a complication, and then the rest of the movie is the resolution. Does that make sense? Every movie you ever read has that kind of basic plot, those three components. And uh, many novels follow the same, the same <coughs> um, uh, situation. Um, Solzhenitsyn doesn't follow that. Um, Dickens doesn't follow that. You know, the greatest writers in history do not follow situation, complication, resolution. They're much more complex than that. But um, overwhelmingly, any movie you watch, um, most modern novels will include a situation, a complication, and the resolution is where the hero of the plot comes out. 
And so uh, we find this basic structure in many of the stories of the Bible, including the story of Hagar. So next slide, we come to the situation of Hagar. And we're going to pick up the story. I'm going to show you the, the text on the screen. Um, if you want to be looking in your Bibles, that's great. But I'll, I will be showing the text on the screen here today. We're going to pick the story up in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And this is the situation that Abraham or Abraham and Sarai found themselves in. And it says there, <clears throat> Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a what? A great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a what? A blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the what? All the families of the earth, as every family here today and every family in Wichita, Kansas, shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haram. Now, Abraham has just gone through his midlife crisis. Because God calls Abraham from Ur the Chaldees to leave his, his, his country and his kin and to move around the, the fertile crescent from Ur um, all the way up to modern-day northern Iraq, then down through Lebanon and down to Israel or Canaan. So God calls Abraham to make that journey around the Fertile Crescent. But when Abraham gets to northern Iraq, to modern-day Haran, his father is dying. And so he waits there um, for his father Nahor to die. So Abraham is stuck, and he's there for a number of years looking after his father. And uh, you might say this is a classic midlife crisis. God had called Abraham to do something, but Abraham couldn't make forward progress to do what God wanted of him because he was honoring his elderly father who could no longer make the journey. So Abraham has that classic midlife crisis. And what does he do during this midlife crisis? He does three things. One is he honors his elderly father and he looks after his father until he dies in Haran. The second thing Abraham does is he reinvigorates his walk with God because he knows he's coming into the badlands of Canaan. And before Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, there is no record of Abraham ever building an altar. But the only record of Abraham building altars is after his father dies and he continues the journey into the promised land, he starts building altars. So he prepares spiritually for what he knows is ahead. And the third thing he does, he says uh, later on in, in Genesis when Lot is stolen, uh, Abraham chases after Lot and the kings who have captured him with 318 trained men in his household, which tells you that Abraham made, he, he knew what was coming and he prepared for it. And so likewise, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old now. I'm getting to that stage of life where I need to think about caring for my elderly parents, where I know that there's a retirement coming up ahead if Jesus doesn't come soon. I need to be thinking about that more seriously. And I need to be reinvigorating my walk with God because from now on, my life is going to be a long, slow physical decline. Sorry to say, but that's kind of true for someone my age. And God says <coughs> to Abraham in Genesis 12, Get up from your country and your kindred and your father's house and go to the land that I will show you. <coughs> now, was Abraham faithful to God? Was he obedient? Yeah. Was he 100% obedient to God? No. Why was he not 100% obedient to God? Well, it's because he's human, but look, it says there he took Lot with him. God had said, leave your country and leave your family and go to the land that I will show you. And you're going to have many children, but Abraham is 75 years old. And he's not quite sure he's going to have kids, so he takes his nephew with him because he thinks his nephew will be his descendant. And so Abraham takes Lot with him. Lot is his kindred, it's his nephew. And even though God has said, leave your father's house behind and leave your family behind, Abraham was kind of hedging his bets as he left her Ur, of the Ka uh, Ur then Haram, then goes to Canaan. He's hedging his bets because he's not quite sure that he's going to have kids. So he takes Lot with him. So <clears throat> Abraham is now 75 years old. <clears throat> and um, one year later, oh, I've lost a slide. Look at that. All right. So one year later, um, he, he comes down. Uh, God appears to him again in Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham says to God, Eliezer, my, my, my servant, he's going to be my heir. So first of all, Abraham thinks God's going to fulfill his promise through Lot. And then in Genesis 15, he says to God, I have no children, but my heir will be Eliezer, my servant from Damascus. So Abraham's kind of hedging his bets with God's promises. 
And God appears to Abraham again in Genesis 15 and reaffirms his promise. You are going to have children, and uh, Sarah is going to be the mother of your children. And Abraham's not quite sure how this is going to work. So he's already looked for Lot to be his successor, and he looks for Eliezer, his servant, to be his successor. And then he comes to the scripture reading today. <clears throat> and it says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. So Genesis 15 ends with God saying to Abraham, you're going to, have, you're going to be the father of many peoples through Sarah. And the next chapter, which is our story, the story of Hagar, begins with the phrase, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. So how is God going to fulfill his, his promise to Abraham? Well, Sarah had a slave girl. <clears throat> and the chapter starts with the barrenness of, the barrenness of um, Sarah. It's an interesting verse, chapter, chapter 16 and verse 1, because it starts with the word hey, um, Sarah and it ends with the, the name Hagar. It begins with the name Sarah and ends with the name Hagar. And Abraham is caught literally in the middle between these two women at the start of this story. Right, the, the way the Hebrew is written says there's, there's Sarah and there's Hagar and there's Abraham stuck in the middle. You have two women in the story. One is old and infertile. The other is young and fertile. One is free. The other is a slave. One is from modern-day Iraq. The other is from modern-day Egypt. One has authority, and the other is in a position of subservience. And you may ask yourselves, how did Hagar come into the family of Abram? Well, if you turn to the next slide, um, before this, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, if you can go to the next slide, brothers, thank you, um, Abram had spent some time in Egypt where he had acquired slaves, among other things. It says, when the officials of Pharaoh saw Sarah, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. That was Pharaoh wanted to marry her. And for her sake, he, that is Pharaoh, dealt well with Abram. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys and camels. So during his time in Egypt, um, Abram had acquired great wealth, including animals and including slaves, including, we presume, Hagar entered his household at this time. And we know from Genesis 15 and 16 that 10 years then pass before Sarah comes up to Abraham and says, I think we need to give you Hagar. So they've had at least 11 years from Genesis 12 when the promise is reaffirmed. Then God reaffirms the promises in Genesis 15. And time is passing and Sarah's not having any children. And so Sarah decides to take things into her own hands. So then you come to the complication. If you turn to the next slide. The complication is the fact that Sarah is going to give Hagar to Abraham. And it says, next slide. And so I don't have a clicker here, it doesn't reach. It says, Sarai said to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So she starts out by blaming God. Not a good start. You see that God has prevented me from bearing children. Like he's promised in Genesis 12, and he's promised in Genesis 15, but so far it hasn't happened. And you've been hedging your bets, hey, um, Sir, um, Abram. First of all, you took Lot from Ur of the Chaldees against God's command. And then you thought Eliezer, your servant from Damascus, was going to be your heir in Genesis 15. Um, but we don't, I still don't have a child. And so she says, you see that God has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah, unwise man. Hmm. <clears throat> this isn't a sermon about marriage or marital relations or counseling, but Abraham should not have listened to the voice of his wife because the suffering that came from this is still visited upon our world today, is it not? The conflict between the Arabs and the Jews, which will never go away till Jesus comes again, starts with Abraham listening to the voice of Sarah, and Sarah starts her speech by blaming God for not fulfilling his promises. There's a lack of faith in Sarai, and Abraham listens to his wife. And so <clears throat> this is, a, um, this is a, a terrible situation that Abraham finds himself in. And so he listens to his wife, and his wife says, I've got a slave girl. Her name is Hagar. We don't know her name yet, but we know later. This girl is called um, Hagar. She's from Egypt. And if, you can, give, if she, you can get her pregnant, she'll give the child to me, and I will raise the child as if it were my own. Now, this happened later in the story of Moses, didn't it? where the daughter of Pharaoh raised Moses as her own daughter. Like, I'll take this child and I'll raise it for my own. Um, so we see this elsewhere, but why, what, what was the cultural context for this? Well, Sarah comes uh, from modern-day Iraq, and there you have a picture uh, from the Louvre in France, in Paris, of the Code of Hammurabi. 
It's the most famous legal code in the world. And you can go and see it, and it's written in cuneiform text, and there are uh, over 4,000 lines of text on that, uh, that, um, that carving. It's about 2.3 meters tall. Let's say it's like seven feet tall. Now, that's the code of Hammurabi, and this is the first known written legal code in human history. It goes back before the time of Moses. And so Sarah, she says, well, God's not fulfilled his promise to us, so let's look for the easy cultural option, the way out. And I'm going to give you Hagar, and you're going to get her pregnant, then I'm going to raise the kid for myself. And it'll be count that this will be the child of promise. So the code of Hammurabi, you can see it today, it's actually very sophisticated. Now, we tend to think that, the, that as we go through history, humanity gets more complex. That's not true. If you study human language, you realize that we are devolving our language. We're not evolving in complexity. So we have active and passive voices in English. I see, I am seen. If you go back to Koine Greek, you have three voices. You have active, passive, and middle. I see is active, I am seen is passive, I myself see or I am seen by myself is middle voice. And so they have three voices in Greek and we only have two. But if you go back to Akkadian, which is the language of Babylon, you have six voices. So this, this, this cuneiform text looks really primitive. But what that tells you is that if there are six voices in the language, we only have two in English, they active and passive, it means that their capacity for precision of expression was infinitely greater than ours today. Okay? So our language is getting more and more simple. And if you've got a teenager and you're texting, you know that we're going to emojis. Okay? LOL. I mean, I'm having to learn with my teenage girl what all these acronyms mean because, um, you know, she sends me something like TBI and I think, what on earth does that mean? So I have to go to Google. I don't want to admit I don't know it. Like, what does TBI mean? And it says, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, it's. It's, uh, <clears throat> that's what happens with Google these days. <clears throat> well, the code of Hammurabi, it allowed a childless wife to give one of her slaves to her husband to obtain children through the slave girl. The code of Hammurabi then specified the rights of the slave girl, and it regulated the relationship with the mother, uh, the, the original wife, and with the slave girl herself. And it regulated the relationship in order to reduce jealousy, bitterness and family in fighting. So even though the Code of Hammurabi is only seven feet tall, with over 4,100 lines of text in it, it was a complete legal system. It's a remarkable discovery that was found here back in the 19th century. And if you go to Paris, you'll see it there in the, in the Louvre, I think it is. And so Sarai looks for a, for a human solution that reflects her cultural background in modern day Iraq or ancient Mesopotamia. So in Genesis 12, as we've already seen, Abraham told Sarai when they went to Egypt that you must only tell people that, I am, that you are my sister and you mustn't say that you're my wife. So just as Abraham, through lack of faith, was willing for Sarai to have a child from an Egyptian father, what goes round comes round, and now Hagar is willing for Sarah, Abraham to have a child from an Egyptian mother. So what Abraham had done to Sarah in Genesis 12 now comes back to haunt her in Genesis chapter 16. What goes round comes round. And Sarah begins by blaming God. God has prevented me from having children. And so she proposes that Sarah, uh, Abraham have a child through Hagar because um, Sarah is going to fulfill her own needs with or without God. God has promised 11 years ago, but God has not delivered. And Abraham, you thought you could solve God's promise by taking Lot. And then you thought you could solve God's promise by taking um, Eliezer as your descent, as your uh, successor. But God uh, didn't allow those cases. So I'm going to figure out a way of, figure, of making God's promises come true. And you're going to have a child with Hagar. Sarah does not seem particularly concerned about the seed of Abraham, the fate of Hagar, or the will of God. But she, really, does she think this will be the child of promise? Because she concludes that Genesis 16, verse 2, by saying, it may be. It may be, she says, that I shall obtain children by her. So even Sarah is not so sure that this is what God wants her to do. She pushes ahead with it anyway, but she's not sure that it's the right thing to do. You might say her conscience is troubling you. And tr she's right, her conscience is troubling her. And so she goes ahead with a human expedient solution, but she says, it may be that God may give me children through this human expediency. 
Like Abraham, you've been expedient. Now it's my turn to be expedient. God hasn't fulfilled his promises. We're going to figure this out for ourselves. And it may be that God will give me a child. Clearly her conscience is troubling her. And we've just come through two and a half years around the world where everybody in this room has had to make a choice about conscience one way or the other. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm not going to discuss the pros and cons of it today. That's not, not really the topic for today. But my wife was raised in the Soviet Union, and when she became an Adventist in 93, she said that when she joined the church, <clears throat> there were people who throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, they had refused to allow their children to go to school on the Sabbath, which is the requirement of the Communist Party. And because of that, their children were taken away from them and put into KGB orphanages. That's the secret police of the Soviet Union. And those church members were denounced as troublemakers inside the church because if the parents won't send their kids to church on Sabbath, then the pastors and the, and the union would get a problem from the KGB. Like you're not teaching your parents, you're not controlling your, your members enough, they need to send their children to school on the Sabbath. The pastors got it in the neck from the KGB when members refused to send their kids to school on the Sabbath. And so for the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, those who stood up for conscience within the church were viewed as pariahs and troublemakers. But when communism collapsed, those same pariahs and troublemakers overnight became the heroes of faith. Just remarkable how, how the situation changed. My wife was reflecting on this with me, and she says, Conrad, she said, <clears throat> you may act in conscience and take a certain decision. You believe that's what the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you. And you may face condemnation from the church, may face condemnation from society at large. But she says, that doesn't matter because society and the church can change just like that. And the pariahs of yesterday become the heroes of tomorrow. What matters is that you live according to the light and the conscience that God has given you today. That is what you're answerable for. We do not make our decisions based on public applause or approval. We do not base make our decisions because it's popular in the church. Each one of us has to make a decision based on the light that God has given us, the life situation we find, within our, uh, we find ourselves in, the understanding that we have in the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. And then we are to respect each other's decisions. Because different people come to different conclusions. And they're honest, honestly held in different conclusions. It doesn't mean that somebody's right and somebody's wrong. It genuinely means that they have come to an honestly held different conclusion. So for instance, let's take the, the, the vaccines for a minute. And this is kind of a, digre a, di a divergence here from what we're talking about. Um, <coughs> If you have a universal vaccination policy, where does the burden of risk fall in the society? It falls on the children. Why? Because if you're 80 years old and you got the COVID vaccination, you're not gonna be around for much longer anyway to see what long-term consequences are, if there are any. But if there are gonna be any long-term consequences, it's gonna be the children will suffer those for the rest of their lives. So a universal vaccination policy is unethical because it, it has a disproportionate shifting the burden of risk on the children who have no say in the process. You follow me on this? So the point about this is we are to act in harmony with our conscience regardless of what society or the church tells us because we are accountable to God for our consciences. Our accusing or excusing thoughts, the conflicting thoughts of the mind, says Romans chapter 2, in the final judgment, um, it is the, the conflicting thoughts of our minds who either accuse us, that means you lived against your conscience, or excuse us, that means they will be the means of God's grace because we lived with our conscience while we were here on planet Earth. So Sarah is not living according to her conscience. What she proposes may be culturally acceptable, if we come to the next slide, but it went against God's express will for marriage. Polygamy was never part of God's plan for holy matrimony. And it has only succeeded in history in bringing heartache, jealousy, and infighting wherever it is practiced. And when we talk about polygamy, uh, we, we tend to forget in the West that there are many, many different kinds of marriage out there um, that is, is more than just like a man and a woman. Uh, so, for instance, in Nepal, uh, rural Nepal, where land is scarce because of the Himalayan mountains and, and it's hard to raise a child, you have what is known as polygyny. Polygyny is where you have one woman and multiple husbands. Polygamy is where you have one man and multiple wives. That's what we normally think of as when we think about these things. But polygyny takes place where you have one woman and multiple husbands. 
because nobody knows who the father of the child is and because resources are so scarce to live in, multiple men are working to support that woman and her child. So as you go around the world as a missionary, you get to see there are very, very different structures of marriage in different parts of the world. Um, but the bottom line is this, whenever we, whenever we ignore God's revealed will, problems inevitably arise. And Abraham listened to Sarah just like Adam listened to Eve. Now, there are multiple allusions in this verse, Genesis chapter 16 and verse 2. There are multiple connections with Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve, and Eve taking the fruit and giving it to her husband. So, um, in Genesis 3, it says the woman said, and Genesis 16, verse 2, says Sarah said. In both verses, it re reads, she took in the Hebrew. In both, both verses, it says she gave to her husband. In both verses, Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah, it says he listened to the voice of his wife. In both verses, talk about the seed and something being good in her eyes. And in both stories, God comes looking for the victims. There are multiple allusions between Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, and Genesis 16. In both cases, you have a husband and a wife who know what God's will is, but they somehow choose to figure out their own way in life. And therefore, there are massive implications for the human race. When we choose to operate outside of what we know to be God's revealed will, we should not be surprised when things start going wrong. And if things start going wrong in your life, it may be worth asking yourself and doing a self-audit and saying, am I living in harmony with God's revealed will? And oftentimes, we realize that we're not. Oftentimes, you say, well, I know that's what my mother or my father taught me, but we're somehow wiser than that these days. I read it somewhere in the Bible, this is a sin, but you know, God will understand. I have extenuating circumstances. Psalm 127 verse 1, you see the verse on the screen says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So when we want to have a strong family and a strong marriage, we need to build it in harmony with the principles that God has given us within the scriptures. The word house uh, in the Greek is, is oikos, we get the word household from that. The English word economy, the national economy, is the national household. And so whether you manage your household well or you manage the national economy well, uh, the, the, there are principles that apply to the economy and there are principles that apply to the household and also to the household of faith. Now, next slide. Isaiah chapter 5 discusses you know, what happens in nations where they do not build their, their nation according to the principles of God that we find in Scripture. Ah, or woe, you who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's a good description of the West today. That right is celebrated, right is that, that which is biblically right is denounced as being hate speech or a hate crime. That which is biblically immoral is celebrated as being the new way to live. And if you speak against it, you will be destroyed or cancelled. And so we are, we are consciously and willfully rejecting our back on a biblical heritage in the West, and the inevitable harvest will be bitterness and pain for generations to come. The ripple effect of sin is tragic. When sin enters your relationship, or there is a cherished sin in your life, it was spread to your, from yourself to those nearest and dearest to you. It affects your relationships. And it can spread and pollute all around. Sin has a ripple effect. So does righteousness. Turn to the next slide, brother. Exodus chapter 34 is a beautiful promise. This is the character of God. And this is God passing for Moses. And God says to Moses, the Lord passed before him and, and proclaimed. This is, and Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says, well, my glory is my character. And this is the character of God. He says, the Lord or Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love to the what generation? Thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the what generation? The third and fourth generation. That is, sin has a ripple effect, that when you engage in willful, deliberate sin in your life, it will affect your children, whether you like it or not. A father who is an alcoholic is in all likelihood going to see his son become a what? Alcoholic. A father who beats his wife in all likelihood, what's going to happen to his son? Will he beat his wife? Yes, he will. The sins of the fathers are replicated from generation to generation. But this verse tells us that God is merciful, 
that he limits the harm of sin beyond the third and fourth generation, but those who are in a covenant relationship with God, God keeps chesed, that is steadfast love. It's the most wonderful word of the Old Testament, chesed. It means God's covenant faithfulness, God's mercy, his faithfulness to fallen humanity. God keeps um, chesed, or steadfast love, to the what generation? To the thousandth generation. That is, you can change your family tree and you can stop and break the cycle of the, the, from father passing on the sins to the children, you can break that by entering into a covenant relationship with God and asking God that no longer will the sins of the fathers be passed on to the third or fourth generation, but the righteous relationship of the father with his heavenly father will re result in blessings to a thousand generations in his family line. But you can change your family line, what happens to your children and, and the children you may never see by virtue of your relationship with God today. It's a beautiful promise from God there that God is faithful to your grandchildren because you are faithful to God today. So the story goes on. Next slide, Genesis 16, 4 and 5. It says there, So Abram went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you, I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> I'd have been looking for a divorce lawyer. <clears throat> so Sarah says, Abram, there's my slave girl. Go and get her pregnant. Abram goes and gets her pregnant, and Hagar's status is transformed. She will be a mother Maybe she'll be the mother of the promised seed. It's not going to be Lot. It's not going to be Eliezer. Maybe it's going to be the unborn child in Hagar's womb. But something has now changed. Hagar is no, willing, no longer willing to be treated as a slave. She's no longer willing to be passed around as inanimate meat from Sarah and at Sarah's whim. And so she looks with contempt upon her old, infertile mistress, Sarai. Bitter strife was the result in that family, as today when we ignore the divine blueprint for marriage. Whether it's fornication or adultery or pornography or sexual abuse, each one of these sins leads to profound pain. If you indulge today, you will pay tomorrow. We can't avoid it. I've realized in my life as a pastor that, man, that the number of, the number of ladies I meet who have dysfunctional marriages, and when you talk to them, you realize that they were serially abused in their young years, there was an epidemic in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and probably still is today. So if you are engaging this kind of stuff, I want to call you today, stop it. Because you are harming for generations to come, causing cycles of damage that you will never be around to see, but there'll be pain for generations if you engage in this kind of behavior. While I was driving to Chicago yesterday for the plane to come here, I was um, called by somebody who told me, her story, <coughs> and she's from another country, now living in the United States, and after about 15 minutes, I said, look, sister, I just want to get to the point, uh, were you abused as a child? And then she broke down and said, yes. And everything that happened in her life that went wrong starts with that moment of abuse. And her lack of recovery has sent her off into a very different direction in life. So we may indulge today, but we or our children or our grandchildren will pay tomorrow, and it's a bitter harvest. And so Sarah, she, she turns and blames Abram. I mean, good grief, you know, why would you do this? May the wrong done to me be on you. Like, Abram, this is your fault. You, you forgive, you, if Abram must be forgiven by saying, like, let's have a time out here, Sarah. You know, let's just tell, recite the story here. How did this happen? Adam blamed, like Adam blamed God for Eve and Eve blaming the serpent. And so now Sarah refuses to take responsibility and she blames Abram. She knows her mistake, but because sin has entered, right thinking has gone and the marriage is now torn. Now the next verse, Abram remains utterly detached. Abram is actually no better in the story. Abram says to Sarai, your slave girl, he says, is in your power. Do to her as you please. And Sarai dealt harshly with her and she ran away from her. He says, your slave girl is in your power. Can you imagine how callous Abram is? Like, he's the head of the family. He could have said, uh, Sarah, let's just have a little conversation about this. How exactly did Hagar get pregnant? And whose idea was it? 
And who was pressuring me to get her pregnant? Sarah. Like, I'm not looking at anybody in particular here, Sarah. But who was pressuring me to get Hagar's pregnant? But not a word about that. Abraham is utterly detached. He does not refer to Hagar as his concubine, like a second-class wife. He doesn't refer to her as his wife. He doesn't even refer to her as the mother of his child. He admits to having no involvement whatsoever in the whole sorry situation. He doesn't recognize his own involvement. Why? Because when sin enters your life, when sin enters your heart, when sin enters your home or your marriage, it's like starting down a ski slope. And hearts become progressively hardened, and voices become ever more cruel, and words are spoken that should never have been uttered. So the best way to avoid those heartless and cruel words to be spoken is to cut them off at the source, which is the original sinful behavior. So Abraham, he, um, he doesn't admit any involvement here. Now the Code of Hammurabi said that in such situations, the, the slave concubine could not be sold. So Abraham doesn't have the option of selling Hagar off. Now she's pregnant, he has a legal responsibility to her in the code of the day. She's now part of his household, and Sarah knows this, so she treats Hagar cruelly. The word dealt harshly with her um, reflects that it's the same word in Hebrew that is used later in Genesis when God says that when your descendants go down to Egypt, the Egyptians will deal harshly with them. So right now, Abraham and Sarah are dealing harshly with an Egyptian, and what goes round comes round when the descendants of Abraham go down to Israel, to Egypt, the Egyptians will deal harshly with the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. What goes round comes round. So now Hagar is on her own. Abraham won't defend her. Sarah is cruel to her. Lot is nowhere to be found. Eliezer, the manager of the household, is utterly silent. And God is nowhere. So this pregnant teen is on her own. She's maybe the first runaway teenage pregnant teen in history. This pregnant teen has no one to turn to. Nobody speaks up for her or for her unborn child. Like many single mums today, like many pregnant teens today. Loneliness overwhelms her. Her life is unbearable. So what does she do? She runs away. She's not the first pregnant teen to flee an unhappy home. And where does she go? She goes, we know, goes back to Shur, which is on the road to Egypt. She's going back to her homeland. Maybe she'll find family back there. And so this lonely teenage girl runs away from Abram. <coughs> In the process, Hagar lost her home and the father of her unborn child. Sarai lost her maid. Abram lost a wife and he lost an offspring, possibly even the promise, the child of promise, and the home was torn apart. Abraham and Sarah had mistreated an Egyptian, and years later the Egyptians would mistreat the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. In both stories, we find oppression. In both stories, the story of Hagar and the story of the Exodus, the victim fled. And in both stories, it says the victim fled into the wilderness. The seed of sin can yield a bitter harvest for generations to come. And I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but if there is a sin in your life that needs repenting of, repent of it today because your God is offering you mercy. And he wants to turn around that bitter seed that will last for generations to your children and your children's children, your children's children's children, children you will never meet. He wants to turn that round into the blessings of God for those children. But that only happens when we turn from our sins today. And so then we come to the resolution. Let's turn to the next slide. The resolution of this, of this terrible complication. Hagar is fleeing away from Abram. She's fleeing away from uh, Sarai. And uh, she comes to the wilderness of Shur, that is, on the borders of Egypt. Next slide. It says, The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, and the spring was on the way to Shur. And thank you for the water here. <coughs> Much appreciated. <coughs> she flees back to the eastern borders of Egypt. This is inhospitable terrain. If you ever go to the Middle East and you go to the Sinai Desert, there's literally nothing there. The Sinai Desert... It's just it's a, it's a barren rock. There's, 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 sometimes there's a bit of sand, sometimes there's the odd thorn bush there, but it's basically nothingness. It makes, the, it makes um, New Mexico and Arizona look like the Garden of Eden. All right, the, the wilderness of Zin and the Sinai wilderness, there's nothing there. It's just barren rock. And so she's fleeing through this terrible wilderness. Death is certain unless she finds water. But the text says the angel of the Lord, what? What did he do? He found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. So she's fleeing through the wilderness, 
The angel of the Lord meets her. Actually, he finds her. And when God finds her, he brings her the immediate solution to her immediate need, which is the need for water. And so there's water in the wilderness, which is a contradiction in terms, because there is normally no water in that wilderness. And there's a spring of water there on the way back to Egypt. Now, who is this angel of the Lord? Now, in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, we're told it's an angel. If you look elsewhere, particularly through the book of Genesis, uh, the angel of the Lord is generally used as a reference to Jehovah himself. And as you, as you study further into this, you realize that the angel of the Lord is really the second person of the Godhead. That's Jesus Christ himself before he was incarnate on earth. So this is Jesus looks out for this, t pre this teenage pregnant runaway girl. Jesus, it, it doesn't say the angel of the Lord saw her or he was aware of it. It says he found her. So just as God came looking for a Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and says, where are you? Here you have Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, looking for this teenage pregnant girl and he finds her. When he finds her, the first thing that happens is there is water. The angel found her. Nobody in her, in her darkest moment, God was looking for this runaway teenage teenager pregnant teenager. Nobody else was looking for her. Nobody else cared about Hagar. But God was looking, and God cared, and God found her, and then he spoke with her. Tell me your story. Verse 8, next slide. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord speaks to Hagar, and if we can move forward a slide, brothers. It says there, oh, sorry, go back a slide. There we are. And he said, that is, let's say this is Jesus now speaking. It says, Hagar, slave girl of, Sa of, ha of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Now, does, does Jesus know Hagar's story, yes or no? Yes, he knows the story. So why would Jesus ask Hagar to tell her story? Okay, the same with Adam and Eve, yes? And that there is, there's more to this because um, the, the, one of the first steps of healing is for someone to tell their story. I was a pastor in a church once, and we had an international Sabbath every quarter because it was a very international church. And I would invite, I would realize that in average church like this, many people don't actually know each other. So I would ask five random people every international Sabbath up at the front, and they would have to ask five basic questions like, what's my name? Um, why am I in this city? Um, how did I come to this city? And how did I become a Christian? And what can you pray for? Very simple questions. So everybody would meet, like you may have like a girl from Kenya sitting in the back row of the church, and many people don't know, and she gives her story, and you realize you're in the presence of a hero of faith. Because maybe she made it through the, the refugee camps, or maybe she was driven out by the fighting in Sudan, or maybe she one of the lost boys, he's one of the lost boys of the Sudan. And so this lady stood up, and she said, <coughs> um, this man, this old man stood up and says, I'm from the Czech, Czech Republic. And uh, I was tortured by the, by the Red Army because I became a Christian. And I fled, I fled by night with my wife over the border into Germany. And then I came as a refugee to America. That was the first man that stood up. And when the last lady stood up, she said, her tears in her eyes, she said, yeah, my father was, a mem was an officer in the Red Army in the Czech Republic. And his job was hunting down Christians. We have this kind of connection in the church just at that moment. And the point about this is, is, you may have people in your congregation that may be new to Wichita. Give them the time and the space to just tell their story. Because when they tell their story, you will often find, particularly people who have been refugees or they've, they've suffered for their conscience, you are sitting in the presence of a mighty hero of faith. So take the time to listen to the stories of the brothers and sisters next to you, because what they will tell you are stories that, that make your, str your troubles pale into insignificance. And Jesus says to Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? Right, tell me your story, Hagar. I have time and I'm going to listen to you. Let it all pour out to be listened to, to be heard without interruption. That is the start of Hagar's healing. And now for the first time, we actually have her name. Hagar, it means flight. See, we don't know Hagar's name before Jesus meets her on the road to Egypt. She's not a statistic. If you turn to the next slide, Isaiah 43, 1 through 5 is a beautiful passage. We often read it uh, in the bed of somebody maybe dying of cancer in a hospital. 
And it says there, but now thus saith the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. And I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid for what? I am? I am with you. And we often read this to people in hospital beds, maybe that it's their last day or so before they pass away of some terrible disease, because it reminds people that God says, do not fear you, I have redeemed you. I have called you by what? Name. That God knows your name. And he knows the waters you've passed through. He knows the fires that have scorched you in your life. And you're not a social security number. You're not a statistic. You're not a number to him. He knows you by name. And to be known by your name is, an, is, a, is a humanizing thing. It, it strips away the... the um, the, the, the industrial nature, you might say, of many of the systems that our government puts in place. Um, there was a, a, an old movie that we as pastors had to watch in Minnesota Conference. I think it was called Wit. And it's the story of an English professor, and the opening scene is she's diagnosed with an aggressive ovarian cancer. That's the opening scene, and she's in shock. She's an English professor, and then she goes to the hospital, and, it's, and, it's the, and the story charts the, uh, from the moment of diagnosis to the moment of death how she's treated through the hospital system. It's an incredible story. It's a movie, it's called Wit. And um, it's an English actress, I forget her name now. But anyway, um, what you see in there, as she enters the hospital system, she's progressively dehumanized. Like, what's your name? What's your date of birth? And um, what's your address? And everywhere she goes, they want her date of birth. And then the doctor comes into her and says, I've got some other doctors, they want to take a look at you because you're an interesting case. And they're kind of examining her womb area, and it's dehumanizing for this woman. It's, it's, a, it's a profound story, actually, of what it's like to be dehumanized in, in some of the systems of our world today. But when God meets us on our own, ro on our own road to Egypt, <coughs> he has the time for us to tell our story. And this lady that called me yesterday on the road to Chicago, she says, well, Pastor, you know, uh, wh what are we going to do? I said, well, the first thing I want you to do is because I don't have time, I'm about to get on a plane. I want you to sit down and type out your entire story and send it to me by email. And I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to interrupt you. You just need the time to tell your story. And take your time in the telling of the story because God will bring things to remembrance. But to tell your story is the starting place of the healing process. God knows Hagar's name just as he knows your name. To God or to Jesus, Hagar is not a statistic. She's not just another runaway pregnant teen. She's his daughter. And he's found her in the wilderness, and he's provided her with water. And he says, Hagar, tell me your name. Now, her name actually means flight, like mean running away from something. That's what the name means. It's a strange name, but let's not forget that uh, Hagar did not meet God at Abraham's altar, nor did she meet God in Abraham's God-fearing household. She met God for herself while she was fleeing this God-fearing household, and she was dying in the wilderness of thirst. And sometimes, in God-fearing households, our children need to leave that household to meet God for themselves. We tend to think that our home is the safest place for our children, but in this story here, Abraham's house, where he built altars to God, where he was the father of the faithful, was not a particularly safe place for that teenage girl to be. She needed to run away from that God-fearing household in order for Jesus to meet her personally. And so this runaway teenage pregnant girl, she meets Jesus. And uh, we go back to the text. <clears throat> Let's go, go forward a slide and then another slide. Thank you. Then the Lord, angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Now that's a you think, why would Jesus tell her to go back to this abusive home? Why would Jesus tell her to do this? Well, um, <clears throat> there, there are a number of reasons we can give for this. Um, but the first thing is this, is that Jesus, re, 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 Jesus reminds Hagar of the truth of the situation, that is, you are Sarah's slave girl. Even if you go back to Egypt, you are still legally her slave girl. 
And the first part of healing is the telling of the truth. Unless there is truth in a conversation, there can be no healing. You know, I go to my annual medical, well, on an annual basis. I call it the ritual of humiliation. And they have, <coughs> and they have uh, there's, a, there's a female doctor where I go, and she says, oh, I've got these couple of people in with me. Do you mind? Well, actually, I do mind, actually. But um, <coughs> anyway, they poke and they prod and they do all their, you know, inhuman things to you in your annual medical, yes? Some of you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and then you stand on the scales and they say, my, you put on weight. No, it's my winter boots somewhere and they're, they're worth five pounds. Any of you had that experience? Yes. And the doctor says, well, Mr. Vine, says, what's going on in you with your health? And if I've got a problem with my ear, why would I say I've got a problem with my left ankle? Okay. The, the starting point for, a, for a, an honest diagnosis and a treatment plan can only take place when there is truth in that conversation. All right? So in any marital breakdown, in any breakdown between a parent and a child, in any human relationship, if you visit a psychologist or a psychiatrist, the starting place for healing is to be truthful about what the current situation is. Unless you're truthful about what the current situation really is, you're not going to be on a path to healing. And so Jesus says to her, he calls her Sarah's slave girl. That's the truth of the situation, Hagar. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you here. You are a runaway teenage girl, and you're pregnant um, by, your, by your mistress's husband, but you still belong to Sarah. That's the truth of the situation. Now, it may appear harsh to us today, but without truthfulness, there can be no pathway to healing. And so Jesus offers her a pathway to healing. It says, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. In submitting to her mistress, Hagar would actually be uh, being obedient to Jesus. And he says, return to your mistress. Now that word return is used throughout the Old Testament. It means to turn back or literally in most English translations it means to repent. Yes. So when, when this, this verb is used, return to your mistress, what Jesus is saying is, Hagar, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you do bear some responsibility here. And whatever, however you've treated Sarah so that she's driven you away, that she can't stomach you any longer, you bear some responsibility here. And so I'm asking you to repent. And repentance means going back to your mistress and submitting to her, not because you want to, but because I'm the angel of the Lord and I'm telling you to. And I'm asking you to trust me in this, Hagar, because if I am the angel of the Lord and I'm saying to you, Hagar, we're going to have a conversation that's truthful, but I need you to go back to Sarah and submit to her again, you're going to have to trust me with your future. I met you in the desert when you had nothing to live on. You were going to die of thirst, as it later happens in the later, later chapter when, when Ishmael is born. And I met you in the desert. I gave you water. I saved your life. I found you in the desert not to hurt you. And so I'm asking you to trust me, Hagar. I'm asking you to go back to that abusive family. You think it's a hard thing to, for Jesus to say here. You're going to go back to Sarai and go back to Abraham, and you're going to submit to her. This is Hagar's moment of truth. She must make a decision. Is she going to continue fleeing to Egypt, or is she going to return to Hagar and to Abram? Hagar is to return, according to Jesus, and submits meekly to Sarah again. Notice this. God does not condone Sarah's treatment of Hagar. He does not, conde he does not condemn the abusive relationship, the fact that Hagar has been treated like an animate lump of meat. God watches over those who are being hurt by others, but he rarely entrusts the duty of making things right to those who are suffering the unjust treatment. Because then the element of vengeance or revenge comes into the picture. And so the next slide, <coughs> there's a parallel passage to this from 1 Peter. And 1 Peter here is actually just before this, he's talking about Abraham and Sarah. I haven't given you the context here. But uh, Peter says this, husbands, this is an example of what we're talking about here. In the same way, Show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are also heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that what? Nothing may hinder your prayers. Now, if you're praying, Peter knows the Lord's Prayer, and he prays on daily basis, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. So that means that in your daily prayers, are you asking God for forgiveness for your sins? Is that right? Yes. 
So if you're a man asking God for forgiveness for your sins, this verse here says, unless you're treating your wife with honor and dignity and respect, God's not going to listen to your prayers. And if God's not going to listen to your prayer for forgiveness, that means you're going to die in an unforgiven state. That means you're lost. You following this? So what Peter is saying here, and this is in the context of Abraham and Sarah earlier in this chapter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, what Peter is saying is that God has a concern for family relationships, and particularly for men, how they treat their wives. And God takes note of how men treat their wives, and God is saying to the men, Peter is saying to the men of the, of the Christian diaspora here, and God is saying to us today, men, unless you are treating your women with honor and respect, God's not going to hear your prayer for forgiveness. You are in a lost state for as long as you abuse your wife. That's the long and short of it. So men, how do you treat your wives? Are we going to give them a flower for Mother's Day and then continue with verbal abuse throughout the week? Is there going to be domestic violence? Do we think we can get away with it because nobody sees us? The rates of domestic abuse in conservative Christian families is really not a lot different to that in wider secular America. It's a terrible thing. Women, God sees it, and he will bring judgment unless that man repents. That God is not blind to the suffering of the women in the families. God knows what's going to happen, and he knows that there's going to be judgment brought on that man unless he repents and treats his wife with the dignity that comes to anyone who is a daughter of God. So men, treat your wives with respect. And so Jesus sends Hagar back to Sarai and Abram, and we know from elsewhere in the scripture that God sees when this kind of domestic abuse takes place, and God is going to bring judgments in his time. Our role today is to treat one another with dignity and honor, because everybody in this church is created in the image of God, and therefore is not worthy of abuse. The toast may be burnt, I get that, but you can retoast some more bread. It's not the end of the world. We are to pay, men are to pay honor to their wives as to the weaker sex. So the church has gone awfully quiet right now, I can sense that. We're very quiet in here right now. But this is true, this is the word of God. Men, treat your wives with dignity or you may lose your eternal salvation. God is concerned with what happens between husbands and wives, between parents and children, and he is concerned that we all treat each other with dignity and respect, or he will bring a terrible judgment on those who mistreat those around them. And the worst abuse often happens from those who theoretically love us the most. Our work colleagues treat us better than those who are closest to us. And each one of us needs to think this morning, like, how am I treating my husband, my wife, my children, my adopted children, my stepchildren, my stepmom, my stepdad? How am I treating them? God is concerned that we, that we treat each other with respect and dignity because women are also the heirs of the gracious gift of life. That is, God's grace is given to women and to men. Um, he gives his grace to sinners. But he's concerned that people who are abusing others, they will not enter the kingdom of God. So our next slide, <coughs> there it is there, it's on the screen. There's a passage there, Sarah obeyed Abraham, Abraham and called him Lord, etc. So Peter is talking here, he's using the story of Abraham and Sarah as a context for this particular command. Our next slide, Genesis 16:10. And so <coughs> the angel of the Lord gives Hagar a promise. He says, I will greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And so God gives a promise to this runaway pregnant teen. She would become a great nation, similar to the promise that God had given to Abraham, but now there is a crucial difference because God promised Abraham that blessings would come to all nations through his, um, the child of promise, through Sarah, his true wife, and ultimately through Isaac, the child of promise. But those blessings would not come to the world through Hagar nor through her child. Now God's promise to Hagar that she would become the mother of a great nation was conditional upon her, his, upon her obedience to his command to return. And time and again in the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God gives a command and then God gives a promise. And the promise comes true when we're obedient to the command. And if we're not obedient to the command, we're not going to see the fulfillment of the promise. Does that make sense? And so God says to Hagar, I want you to go back to Sarah because you're her slave girl. That's the truth of the matter. I know what's happening. You're going to go back to her. 
But there's a promise for you, Hagar. If you do this, I will bless your offspring so they cannot be counted for multitude. But I'm going to bless you, Hagar. But my blessings are conditional upon your obedience. When the people of Israel entered the promised land, the blessings that God promised were also conditioned upon what? Obedience to God's revealed will. And we cannot ask for God's blessings today while we are living in willful disobedience to his revealed will. And so <clears throat> Hagar has to make a choice, return to Sarai or run away to Egypt. Abraham and Sarai had forgotten that if they waited for God to fulfill his promise, that God's promises to Abraham would be fulfilled. How would Hagar now respond to the same test of obedience from God? Well, unlike Abraham and Sarai, Hagar chooses obedience to God to submit to Yahweh and to wait and trust upon him to work out his promises and his blessings for her and for her unborn son in his perfect time. And so Hagar is the hero of faith. She trusts God. And she goes back to a difficult situation, trusting that the God who met her in the wilderness will be with her back in that abusive home. Whereas Abraham and Sarah had not been waiting for God. They had not been faithful to the command, and so they hadn't seen the fulfillment of the promise. Next slide, Genesis 16, 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord said to her, that's Jesus, now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And he shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall live at odds with all his kin. Uh, God hears the unspoken cries of a runaway teen. He also knows the unborn child in the mother's womb. And this is the first child to be named in Scripture by God. Uh, the other children, there's Isaac, then there's John the Baptist, then there's Jesus. So Ishmael is in a very select company, the father of the Arab nation. So God names this child Ishmael. <clears throat> and so God affirms his concern for Hagar and her unborn child. And this name, Ishmael, will be a reminder to them of God's providence in their lives. This name will be a living witness to Hagar and to Ishmael that God met them in her darkest moment of life and he pointed her on a light on a pathway towards life. This name will be a living witness. Names do carry meaning. The text says he will be a wild ass of a man. And we read that in the Western context. And we think, well, that's not a very nice description of a man, is it? He's a wild ass or a wild donkey, you know? Donkeys are not known for any many major you know, positives. But in the Middle East, they have an animal. It's known as the desert onager, onager. It's like a donkey. It's the word that is used here. It's known in scripture, such as Job, Job 39 and Hosea 8, as a desert animal, not known for its stupidity, but for its fierce independence, its stubborn pride, and its untamable strength. It's a perfect description of the Arab peoples. The next verse, <clears throat> so she, Hagar, named the Lord who spoke to her, you are what? Elroy. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Hagar now knows that she is speaking with Jehovah, and she calls him the God who hears. The God who hears. The God who sees. In fact, earlier in the chapter, in Exodus chapter 3, you have the same phrase for God. It says, And the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry and account of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and they've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. It's the same language that is used for the people in slavery in Egypt as Hagar in the wilderness. That is, God hears and sees his children in distress. Next slide. So the word name Elroy, a name for God, basically means the God who sees me and hears me in my distress. Not just the God who hears and sees me when things are going well, but when things are desperate, when I've lost all earthly means of support, when I'm running away and I don't know what my future holds, I just know my past is terrible, there is the God who sees and hears me and you in our distress. It's a beautiful name for God. God is the one who sees, who hears and acts on behalf of those who trust him. He hears the cries of pain, he sees the anguish of the heart, and he will act to deliver those who look to him. She goes on to say, the next slide, verse 14, Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy, it lies between Kadesh and Beret. Now that name, Beer Lahai Roy, can be interpreted in a number of ways. It can mean the well of the one who sees and lives, or the well of the living one who sees me. It has multiple meanings in the Hebrew. That Hagar first saw a well, then God saw her, and then she saw God. 
The name is ambiguous. It invites reflection among us today on how do we see God and how does God see us. And when God sees us, what does he see? And when we see God, what do we see? Our image of God, how we see God, will determine how we treat those around us. Without a true biblical understanding and vision of who God is, we will not treat people in the way that God wants us to treat others. And so it's incumbent upon us as the worshippers of God to understand in, the, in these names of God who God truly is in order that we might treat our brothers and sisters as our brothers and sisters. When God said to Cain, you know, where is your brother? And Cain says back, am I my brother's keeper? God didn't answer, but the logical answer was no, I called him your brother. Like we have a responsibility to our neighbor. They are our brothers, we're in the human race. How we treat others, God is concerned about that. The next verse, please, uh, it says, Hagar, comes to the end of the story, Hagar bore Abraham a son. Abraham named his son, whom, Ab whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And so Hagar returns to Abraham and Sarah. There is no further record of any abuse from Sarah to Hagar, that Hagar is obedient to God's command and God's promises can't start to come true. She has this boy, Hagar. And she tells the story to Abraham. Abraham finally listens to Hagar because she met Jehovah God. She met the God of, of Abraham on the road to Egypt. And um, Abraham listens to his slave girl and calls the boy Ishmael. He doesn't listen to Sarah. Whatever Sarah wants to call the boy is immaterial. It's, uh, Sarah's t uh, Hagar's testimony to Abraham means that Ishmael will indeed be called Ishmael. So for the first time, Abraham is listening to Hagar. So what we can figure out from this is that the relationship has changed. For 13 years, until Genesis 17, Ishmael is viewed as the child of promise, until God's will is more clearly revealed in, in chapter 17 when Abraham is 99. That'll be a story for maybe another year when I come back here. Elroy, the God who sees and hears me in my distress, does not appear as such anywhere else in the Bible. But we do see him through the scriptures, and more importantly, he does see us. Next verse. For the eyes of the Lord <clears throat> range throughout the entire earth to strengthen those whose heart is true to him. For those who today need strength in their heart, who want to be true to God, but maybe they say the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, God is looking for you today in order that he might give you the strength that you're looking for. Next verse. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. God sees everything that goes on in your life. There's no secret you have from God. Daniel chapter 5, at Belshazzar's feast, Daniel talks about the heavenly watchers. Though there are angels who, who record everything that happens in your life and in my life. Nothing is hidden from God. What you do in the privacy of your room at home is not private. It's known on a, on a cosmic scale. For God looks down, he sees all of humanity, and he fashions the hearts of them all. It means he wants to fashion your heart. Later in the book of Ezekiel, the heart he wants to give is a heart that delights to do the will of God. And he wants to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh that finds joy in fulfilling God's revealed will. God is looking for people today who want to do God's will, who want the heart of stone to be taken away and the harsh words of the home to be taken away to be replaced with a heart of flesh that is manifest in loving and gentle words within the family network next verse for the truly the eye of the lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine i see in the news today that america is going to have a food shortage do you see that yeah well, this promise tells me that the eyes of the Lord, he knows those who fear him, who hope in his steadfast love. It's that same word, chesed, once again. His covenant mercy, his faithfulness to his children to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. There was a story came out of Ukraine just recently. They weren't Seventh-day Adventists, but they were Sabbath-keeping Christians in Ukraine. When the fighting started in March or February, they went into the basement of their apartment building. They had two liters of water and they had two bags of cookies. They were down there for more than two weeks and the water never ran out and the cookies never ran out. They were, sab were Sabbath-keeping Christians 
And we're seeing stories of miracles coming out of Ukraine, of bombs landing in churches and not going off when they should go off. Of God watching over his own, of those who are faithful to him in the midst of a world gone crazy. It says, truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. El Roy is the God who sees and hears us in our, hours of, in our hour of distress, and he's watching over us in order to preserve our life beautiful picture of God. Next slide. I think it's the last one here. I lift my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? That's all this, the King James says anyway. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Lord will keep you going out and you coming in from this time on and forevermore. It's a beautiful passage, yes? I lift up my eyes to the hills. That is, who can I look to for sustenance and um, salvation in this world? And actually, I find my salvation in God himself. I looked my, lift up my eyes to the hill and I see the God who sees me because he doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber nor he sleeps. He's watching over me. Elroy is the God who watches over you in your distress. He hears the anguish of the heart. He sees the distress that we go through, and he's watching over us to find us and to turn our life back to a better path. The eye of the Lord, final verse here. I think this is the final verse. <clears throat> the eye of the Lord, in our next slide, brothers, are in every place, <clears throat> keeping watch on the evil and the good. That is... There is no evil that is done in this world that God will not bring to light one day, and justice will be done. And if you suffered injustice, you can look to the God who sees to one day make sure that justice will be done on your behalf. So if you've suffered injustice, or if you've been merciful to those in need, whether you give to the poor in, in a hidden way, God sees it. And in both cases, he brings judgment to the wicked and he brings blessings to the righteous. The eyes of the Lord, the God who sees, are in every place, including anywhere in Kansas or Colorado, wherever you may happen to live. The eye of the Lord is in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. So what do we say in conclusion today? Our time is up. It's 1 o'clock, and we need to bring this to a close. Well, next slide. The, the psalmist says, And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord the God who sees and hears me in my distress, have not forgotten those who seek you. We may experience God as El Roy today, because in the Old Testament, Yahweh was the pre-incarnate Jesus. It was he who sought out Hagar by a well, just as he later spoke to a woman at a well in John chapter 4. And just as he watched over Hagar, a teenage runaway girl, running away from uh, an abusive relationship, carrying a man's, an old man's child, just as he watched over Hagar, so he promises to watch over those who are faithful to him today. As he says later in, in Matthew's Gospel, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He knows your past, he's with you in your present, and you can place your trust in him today, not only because he loves you, but because he is the one who sees into the mists of tomorrow. And you can place your future in his hands. Elroy, next slide. He is the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who knows, the God who searches, the God who listens, the God who cares, and the God who delivers. You can put your trust in El Roy, an incredible God that we serve. Many years ago, I was at a bridge. <coughs> I had about $180,000 in my bag. I was crossing from Uzbekistan into Tajikistan, and that money was for Afghanistan. I was about 24 at the time. And the German government, in their foolishness, had told the world that they'd given all this money to ADRA. And because we were working in a war zone, I, um, all my staff just evaporated on me. Because um, if there were jihadis looking for me, they wanted that money. And so when the German government announced to the world that they'd given all this money to ADRA, everybody was looking for me. And I, it felt really bad, actually. So, <coughs> one of the lessons of life, yes? <coughs> and so. Um, I came to this bridge, and there was, there was Uzbekistan, and there's Tajikistan, and Tajikistan's got a civil war between communists and jihadis, and Uzbekistan is a communist um, nightmare with tight controls. 
and the bank gave me the money, ABN Ambro, and they said to me, well, you're not registered in Uzbekistan as ADRA, the Adventist Church is not registered here, so we can't legally give you this money. And I said to them, well, this is what the money's for, it's for Afghanistan, for various uh, disaster zones, so can you just give me the money? And, I, and they said, okay, well, we'll give it to you at four o'clock, and then you've got till five o'clock to cross the border into Tajikistan, and then we'll tell the government, oh, we gave the money to an unregistered entity, and we'll, we'll, we'll take the blame on that. But you have an hour to cross the border. So I, I drove in a taxi to the border with a suitcase or a briefcase, or like, a, like I have here, with $180,000 in it. That's a lot of money. I was on $250 a month as an ADRA country director. That's not a lot of money. I used to debate with my boss. I said, if I get captured by the Taliban and held hostage, will I get paid a per diem? And he says, well, it depends if they feed you three times a day. <laughs> so <coughs> I wanted a per diem because on $30 a day, as it was then, I get $900 a month per diem for sitting in a prison cell somewhere. And that was, to me, was a really attractive prospect when I was on $250 a day, all right? So I stand at the bridge. I come to the bridge, and there's a, a, the, on the Uzbek side, and there's, there's a border guards, and then there's customs, and there's police. So there's three checkpoints. Then you walk across the bridge, and there's a red line on the bridge. That's the border. And you cross over into Tajikistan, and there's a border guard checking your passport. There's the police just kind of shaking you down. And then there's the, 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 the border, the, the customs officials will then shake you down. And everybody who crosses that bridge, basically, you lose anything of value on your body, because every checkpoint is going to shake something out of you. Okay. And so <clears throat> I stood there with that $180,000 thinking, do I declare it or not? Mm. If I declare it, I'll probably lose it at the first checkpoint, and then I may be taken hostage because they think this guy's got money, he's worth money. So I don't want to be taken hostage. Or if I declare it, they'll tell their friends on the other side of the border and I'll be kidnapped and shot and they'll take the money. So I don't want to die, not for $250 a month. Mm, you know, that's really not worth it, is it? So I don't want to die, I don't want to be taken hostage, I don't want to telegraph to the world I've got all this money, what am I going to do? Well, we serve the God who sees and the God who hears. So I said, Lord, I need to cross this bridge, I don't know how I'm going to cross this bridge. And this little old man came next to me, he had a wizened face, he was wearing an Uzbek um, cap on his head, and he spent most of his life in the cotton fields, you could see his face was really battered and, and weathered. And he had a, a, a Muslim kind of prayer jacket on, and he looked up at me and he says, would you like to cross the bridge? And I said, I, I, mean, I, I thought to myself, this guy speaks perfect English. Like, I've never met somebody with this good English in Uzbekistan. Like, how does this old man, who probably never left the Soviet Union, how does he speak such good English? So <coughs> I said, yeah, I would like to cross the bridge, actually. And he said, well, just take, take my arm, and we're going to walk across the bridge. He said, but don't look at anybody. Keep your eyes down. I thought, well, I got to cross this bridge, and this is as good as it gets. So it didn't occur to me at the time that something spiritual was happening. So we walked up to the first checkpoint, and there were these people there having their wallets shaken out, and their clothes were being shaken out, and anything that dropped was being confiscated for somehow being illegal. And <coughs> we walked past the police, and nobody stopped us. And I stood out as a foreigner, because your glasses and your shoes give you away as a foreigner overseas, if nothing else does. And so they could see my glasses, they could see my shoes. I wasn't an Uzbek, I wasn't a Tajik, and I walked past the, the border guards and the customs officials like I was invisible. And I came to the middle of the bridge, and I walked over the, the stepped into Tajikistan, and there were three more po um, uh, posts there, and there was crowds at each one, and the police were stopping everybody and shepherding them around and yelling at them, and people were ululating, and people said, oh, don't take away my money, and all that kind of stuff. And I walked past the border guards, and of course, walked past the police, I walked past the, um, the customs officials, and I found myself in a parking lot in Tajikistan with my money intact in my bag. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's a miracle, yeah? <coughs> so I, I wanted to thank the guy, but I couldn't find him. He'd just gone. And so, you know, I thought, well, I'm, I want to get down to Dushanbe, the capital. So I hired a taxi and I put the money, I, t I taped it inside up into the, um, the, the well, the wheels. I, I taped it up in there because people stop you on the roads and steal things from you. So I got down into Dushanbe and you know, the work continued. But the point about it is this, is that you know, God sends his angels to watch over his children in their moments of distress. And when God met Hagar, the God who sees and hears us in our distress, the God who saw me in my moments of distress, he sent somebody to help me as well. And so, blessed is the man that knoweth your name, he will put his trust in you. Know the names of God. Step out on them in faith. 
in obedience to the commands of God, and you will see God's promises to you come true in your life. Don't try to force God's promises so that you make them come true like Abraham and Sarai did. Trust God as did Hagar, and God's promises to you will come true in God's way and in God's time. The God who sees us and who hears us in our distress, I invite you to put your trust in him today. Let's bow our heads and we'll close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, <coughs> you look down from the heavens, <coughs> you see this congregation. You know the homes we've come from, the stories of our lives. Nothing is hidden from you, Father, for you are the God who sees. We humbly ask, Father, that each one of us will have the grace and the discernment to follow your will for our lives, to live in harmony with your commandments, to seek the good of those around us. As we follow your leading in our lives, we ask that your promises to us will come through in a very personal and very beautiful way. Father, I pray those promises will come true, not in our time, but in your time and in your way, in a way that will be a blessing, not just for us, but for our children and our loved ones and for our children and their children and so forth. Father, today we place our trust in you, for you are the God who sees and who hears and who turns our distress and the valley of despair into the valley of rejoicing. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer today. In his precious and your precious name we ask. Amen. Are you glad that God is the God who sees? Let's sing one, uh, one verse of the hymn and then we're going to go eat. You guys ready for that? All right, let's, let's sing these words. Go ahead and stand with me as we sing these closing words. What a fellowship, what a joy to find leaning on the everlasting arms. God not only sees, he has the arms to hold us up. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning. everlasting arms. God, we lift up our voices, our hearts to you in this place today. You are the God who sees. And God, some of us in this place today are Abrahams. God, we, we are causing harm and not taking responsibility for that, God. And you see it, and we repent of that. God, some of us are Sarahs in this place where we're compromising to get what we want, and we repent of that today, Jesus. Some of us are Hagars, and we suffer at the hands of others. And God, we repent of anything that's keeping us from throwing ourselves on your arms, Jesus, because you're the only one that can hold us up. You bring healing, you bring forgiveness, you bring victory. You have everything we need, Jesus. You are the God who sees. We look forward to meeting you in person very soon, Jesus. Until that time, keep us faithful. God, help us to do justly. Help us to love mercy. Help us to walk humbly on this earth. And God, as we go to eat now, we thank you for the food, the hands that have prepared it. We pray that you'd bless our time and our fellowship. We thank you for Dr. Vine and his blessing to us today. And we just thank you for everything on the Sabbath day and ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve.